The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Canceling the Cascade of VOD SOS, Team-Based Prophylaxis, Diagnosis, and Customized Management. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash EJG 860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Good afternoon, everybody. Please welcome to this uh, lunch uh, symposium. As it was mentioned earlier this morning, it's such a great pleasure to meet together and mingle, collaborate, exchange, interact. My name is Mohamed Moti. I'm from the Sorbonne University and Saint Antoine Hospital in Paris. And I'll be moderating this session entitled Cancelling the Cascade of VOD SOS, Team Based Prophylaxis, Diagnosis, and Customized Management. Uh, today, I'm joined by a distinguished faculty, Dr. Christine Duncan. I think I don't need to spend a lot of time to uh, explain to this uh, audience the problems we face with these early complications, namely the endothelial syndromes after transplant, which are mainly in relation with injury to the endothelial cell, uh, build up of toxic metabolites from the conditioning, but also alloreactivity. And this will lead not only to VOD, but now there's a lot of excitement about TMA, about engraftment syndrome, uh, about uh, diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, press syndrome, etc. So really a uh, relatively rare group of complications, but they can be devastating. So I think... Uh, we all agree I, that VOD typically develops within three weeks or allo, but we do see late onset VOD. The incidence can vary depending on your practice, what type of conditioning regimen, your catch population. Uh, obviously, some high-risk populations can experience, unfortunately, high rates of VOD and without a treatment, the outcome of VOD uh, can be uh, terrible, more than 80% survival uh, mortality. Uh, also, new analysis, uh, there are analysis and findings highlighting, for instance, an increase of VOD in younger adults. This has been published a few days ago, I think, in Blood Advances. And this is in line with what we know also from the uh, children and babies. And obviously, uh, the complexity of VUD is about the challenges uh, regarding the diagnosis and the grading of severity, because we know very well it's a dynamic process. It's very difficult to get all the symptoms at the same time, and you will see uh, time is crucial when it comes to early initiation of uh, therapy. And we also know that there is a significant proportion of underdiagnosed VOD cases. And we've done an EBMT study which could show that a significant proportion of those patients declared dying of multi organ failure, actually, the trigger was VOD. So, with this, our goal for today is uh, to share together and augment the knowledge about risk factors the most recent data regarding diagnosis, staging, but also treatment in order to equip the uh, healthcare professionals involved in this field with the right tools to provide the most appropriate and rapid treatment. So without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Christine Duncan from Dana-Farber, who will give us actually the pediatric perspective. Christine, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, just getting right into this, I think the case that we had at the beginning, this is based on a real case of a patient that we've cared for at my institution, but it could very clearly apply 
uh, to many other pediatric patients um, with similar diseases. So this is a pediatric patient who's diagnosed with HLH. It's a two-year-old patient who has the STX11 mutation and then presented with prolonged fevers, cytopenia, splenomegaly, and hepatomegaly. The patient received prior to transplant therapy with corticosteroid, etoposide, and amipalumab. A stem cell transplant is planned, and this is using a busulfan-based conditioning. So the questions we want you to think about are, what are this patient's risk factors for VOD after transplant? And if there are elevated risk factors, should you do anything? What should you choose to do? So jumping a little bit ahead, yes, of course, there are risk factors for this patient, and they are elevated. So busulfan conditioning, certainly a risk factor. Hepatomegaly, so prior hepatomegaly related to the HLH. HLH by itself as a diagnostic entity has an increased risk of VOD. And so all of these things are elevating this patient's risk for VOD. So there are risk factors, obviously, that overlap between adult patients and pediatric patients, but there are some that are much more likely to be present in children. So on the column under the adults, we know that these are the established risk factors that we'll talk about. But in pediatrics, additional risk factors are related to age. So infants, very young children being at risk for HLH. With a pediatric or the genetic diseases with higher than expected incidences, so things like HLH or osteopetrosis, rare diseases, but very difficult diseases to transplant. We also, for these criteria, we need to be able to properly assess the ascites and hepatomegaly in patients. And given pediatric conditions, particularly the non-malignant conditions, HLH, osteopetrosis, the mucopolysaccharidoses, there's a high incidence of disease-related hepatomegaly coming into transplant and even elements of ascites in certain patients. And a critical difference or a big difference that we're going to talk about today is defibrotide prophylaxis. So the European study, which demonstrated efficacy for the prevention of SOS or VOD in children in a prospective randomized trial, and we'll get into sort of the we'll get into the nuances of that. So based on current evidence and data, the EBAT refined risk factors, and this was published in 2023. And so these risk factors are classified as modifiable or unmodifiable, although sometimes it's difficult to determine one from the other in cases. And this is to help, the whole goal of this is to help provide guidance on reducing risk factors and improving patient management. So you can see the long list of things on the left, the unmodified risk factors, so second transplant, advanced diseases, and with the addition of primary immunodeficiency disorders um, is there, certain genetic polymorphism, older age, and you can see that entire list. And then the modifiable risk factors, those related to conditioning. So these are somewhat modifiable. Obviously, for patients, you want to treat the disease, the whole reason they're there, there, and not to be afraid of VOD and modify it, but just to be aware of that as you're taking care of that patient. So high-dose conditioning regimens in, pe in pediatrics, many of us would consider this a pretty unmodifiable risk factor depending on what the disease you are transplanting. Uh, oral or high-dose busulfan, which with oral we're no longer using in pediatrics, and PK-based dosing has helped us tremendously in this regard. Uh, even cases of high-dose creosulfan or TBI-based regimens. The donors, unrelated donor, or an HLH mismatch donor, HLA, excuse me, mismatch donor, um, and the prophylaxis regimen. So these are recently added to the modifiable risk factors, including serolimus, methotrexate, and tacrolimus, methotrexate and the calcineurin inhibitor, a non-T-cell depleted transplant, and then finally, the use of parental um, nutrition, or TPN. Uh, just one point of guidance about that or caution is that patients need to get nutrition, obviously. That's critically important to the support. So none of these are saying, none of us are saying we should avoid PN, but if you can, try to encourage enteral feeding. So in addition to these, from the pediatric perspective, I would add some of the other rare pediatric diseases, osteopetrosis, HLH. Um, older age is certainly a risk, but we also know that infants are at higher risk for VOD and severe um, manifestations of VOD. Uh, the other things we would add from the, um, from the pediatric perspective is to include the Lansky score as well as the uh, Karnofsky score for performance. So really getting into the heart of our discussion about prophylaxis. And so this is the randomized VOD prophylaxis EVMT trial in pediatric patients. And so it's a large study, enrolled 365 patients who are receiving stem cell transplant 
with the majority of them, so two thirds being patients receiving an allo transplant and one third roughly patients who are receiving an auto transplant with a median age of six and a half years. So very representative of a pediatric transplant population. In the patients who received defibrotide, there is a significant decrease in the incidence of VOD comparing 20 to 12%, and the VOD was renal failure, so the severe VOD cases in patients also lowered with the use of defibrotide prophylaxis. There was not significant difference in the mortality, and one thing I think I could say about this is that mortality in children with VOD is, um, has improved significantly. We've gotten much better due to supportive care and other things, so it's hard. There's very little mortality in this population overall. Interestingly, the graft versus host disease incidence was lower in the VOD, the group who received defibrotide compared to those who didn't, um, and there was no significance in the patients with severe VOD. So based on this pivotal data, defibrotide was included in the EU guidelines for prophylaxis. Um, so that's one study. We all like to see more data. So we look at the meta-analysis. So this is a meta-analysis published in 2022 comparing uh, or looking at VOD trials using de defibrotide that had a control, so controlled studies. And so we can see the, um, the multiple studies listed on the far side of the slide, and you can see all of the details. I won't take you through every single detail here, but just to look at the swim lanes, you can see that the side favoring defibrotide um, in most of these studies showed a favorable compared to those in the control group. Um, so in this, the overall effect had a Z-score of 2.74, and based on the cum or accumulating all this data, we see the VOD incidence was 16% in the control patients and 5% in those who received IV defibrotide prophylaxis. And the relative risk of developing VOD then for the prophylaxis versus controls was 0.3. And so here's a challenge. And I think a lot of people who think about VOD think about this, the Harmony study and what those outcomes were. And so this is a combined defibrotide versus best supportive care in the prevention of hepatic VOD in the combined, as I said, adult and pediatric setting. The primary endpoint of this study was VOD-free survival at 30 days after transplant. And inclusion criteria included allogeneic transplant in adult recipients, page um, 16 years or older, pediatric patients who are greater than one month to 16 years, so basically open to most pediatric patients, or all. Autologous patients were included if they were pediatrics, and this is a nod or a recognition of the high risk of VOD that's been associated with neuroblastoma. Um, and for all patients, you could include adult or pediatric if you had a feature that made you high risk or very high risk for developing VOD. And so we look over at the outcomes. You know, the best supportive care and defibrotide bars are basically superimposable. And so based on this study, there was no, um, no advantage to defibrotide in the statistical analysis of this group. So I think that leads us at a point, is defibrotide prophylaxis recommended? Is it not recommended? What would you do in your group? And I think it depends a lot on your patient population and how you're feeling. You know, we have a meta-analysis and a prophylactic study in pediatrics that favors and a study of combined in adults that, that does not. And so based on this, uh, Dr. Kobachoglu updated the statement on defibrotide prophylaxis and what I think is important to know is that he was also very instrumental in this study. So giving an opinion for someone who participated um, in this study, so understands the evidence. And so from Dr. Krabachoglu, given the totality of the evidence, and particularly when faced with pediatric patients who are at very high risk of VOD, we would point to the results of the pediatric prevention trial as providing sufficient justification for the use of prophylactic defibrotide in this smaller, highly selected group of patients for which there is unmet, an exquisite unmet medical need. And furthermore, that there are consequences uh, of not recommending any prevention for VOD and already devastating for a substantial number of transplant patients, especially for the high-risk infants. And I think that probably cannot be emphasized enough, being amongst the most vulnerable populations undergoing transplant as well as others. So coming back to our patient, so this is a two-year-old, so toddler age, not infant, but has risks as we've already outlined. So by day four, this patient had high, high fever and cytopenia, which is common in HLH patients who are undergoing stem cell transplant, weight gain with abdominal girt of one centimeter, uh, a 50 gram increase in weight, hypoxia requiring nasal cannula, uh, and ascites in a minor bilirubin elevation. 
So the question to ask yourself is, should you be suspicious in VOD? Pretending you weren't going to talk about VOD, should you be suspicious about VOD in this patient? And would you have those suspicions? If you answer yes, would you have those suspicions if there wasn't increased bilirubin? Would you still have those same concerns? And so, yeah, all of these signs are classic VOD, but it can be really difficult. Symptoms such as weight gain may manifest differently in pediatric versus adult patients. You know, pediatric patient who weighs 10 kilograms is going to have a very small weight gain that counts as 5%. You have to think about that. And you have to look at it day after day, not just one day, for, you know, one day to the next, but look back to compare it to the pre-transplant baseline because it is very easy to get fooled by a toddler or an infant who's gaining you know, a small amount, 100 grams every day, and try to figure out where to go with that because it's easy to, to miss it. So as a review um, for some, the chemical and biochemical signals of VOD. So the signs, right upper quadrant pain, I always think if you touch, uh, you, if you examine that right upper quadrant in a pediatric patient who is asleep, they'll still jump. That is all, it is very specific, in my opinion, when it is there. Hepatomegaly, weight gain, ascites, jaundice, shortness of breath, tachypnea, and decreased urine output. In those laboratory values, you see your elevated transaminases, conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, prolonged PT, signs of synthetic function, dysfunction, elevated creatinine, decreased GFR, and incre decreased oxygen saturation. All, obviously, all of these things don't have to happen at the same time, and hopefully you'll be catching things before people are developing uh, synthetic dysfunction. And so getting back to the differences in hepatic VOD between children and adults, for children, the incidence is about 20% compared to up approximately 10% in adult patient populations. And there are patient populations, things like osteopetrosis, as I mentioned, that have a risk as high as 60% of VOD in that group. Um, another big difference is anecteric VOD and late onset VOD. So late onset VOD is rarely reported in adult patient populations, as is anecteric VOD, but these do occur more frequently in children, and we need to be mindful of those risks or those signs. Um, then moving forward, so based on this, and I think this is really one of the biggest advances in VOD management and diagnosis, and you know when these came out and continuing forward is the separation of the criteria between adult and pediatric patients by the EBMT group. And so for the e pediatric criteria, an important thing to know is that there's no limit on time. It doesn't have to be within the first 21 days. We know it frequently is, but it doesn't have to be. And the patients having greater than or equal to two of the criteria that are listed. Um, so just to highlight some of the differences, otherwise unexplained weight gain on three consecutive days, despite your use of or greater than 5% despite your use of diuretics. The other thing that I think is very useful about these criteria is that they're incorporating imaging. Most of our centers will use imaging when we're thinking about it, but they're not technically part of the, the earlier criteria. So ascites, if it is there, is considered one of the criteria along with the others. In the revised adult criteria, we see similar things, so painful hepatomegaly, waking greater than 5%, ascites, and then the late onset in adults if VOD is diagnosed after day 21. So really the big difference in that is just the time. Uh, we have recently uh, refined criteria from the EBMT for the classification in adults. And so now we think about classic hepatic VOD as day 21 or less, or late onset being greater than 21 days. We also see categories of probable, clinical, and proven uh, VOD the proven is tricky. Many of us are not looking at biopsies in patients. Or many centers are not doing biopsies for reasons of safety and perhaps not quite needed. Uh, or hepatic, hemodynamically proven um, hepatic venous poro gradient. And so probable and clinical are very similar in that in the probable you can have two of the following, bilirubin greater than or equal to two, painful hepatomegaly, waking again, ascites, and now including the ultrasound or the elastography, so using a more uh, modern technique to look at the stiffness or the fibro fibrotic nature of that liver through your ultrasound. And then the clinical having those minus the um, ultrasound guidance. The onset, obviously, we talked about 21 days, more or less. So what the refinement was here, so the classic late onset differentiated really by time only, the addition of elastography and quantification by hemodynamics and the addition of the different states. 
We also have revised criteria that came from uh, Ken Cook, Image Cairo's uh, group, looking at sort of the limitations of those prior tools. So on the left, we see meeting any two of these criteria. So these including, I think, really to point out, the addition of excessive platelet transfusions, consistent refractory thrombocytopenia, um, ascites again there, and the reversal of portal venous flow on the Doppler. Um, this is incredibly important to look at the venous flow on the Doppler, but also noting that reversal is late. So don't wait for late, don't wait for reversal of flow. Look at the rest of the flow. Look if you see dampening or changes in that flow. Or you can have hepatic biopsy consistent or elevated wedge pressure. And so here we compare these diagnostic criteria. And you can see the difference in, the, in, in each of those. Um, and maybe just a question for Professor Modi as we're up here. So you look at these criteria and, and which, ones are, which one is best? I'll use a joker because obviously I'm biased. Fair enough. A little bias up here about the EBMT criteria. I think in my mind there isn't really one that is best or better than others that has been tested. We can't give you data to say that one is best. But I think what each of them does is valuable by adding material or adding things that we need to think about, reminding us of platelets, reminding us of the ultrasound findings, and trying to think about it. So criteria are very valuable when we're studying patients. Having a good clinical sense of a patient is probably even more important when we're treating them. So moving on with our clinical case, uh, we have the two-year-old patient with HLH who has their transplant. Um, on day four, she had the things listed, and then eventually she had VOD with organ dysfunction, which confirmed. Um, she immediately received a, a peritoneal drain, which can be extremely valuable in pediatric patients, particularly if they're having respiratory compromise or decreased urine output. So you're trying to decrease the abdominal competition. She started defibrotide. I had ultrasound guided, uh, iterative ultrasounds following this and very careful, meticulous, really, fluid management. Thank you for your attention. I'm going to pass this off now to Professor Modi to continue with our discussion. Thank you very much, Kristen, for a really beautiful presentation. So my task uh, for the next few minutes or so is to discuss with you how can we, uh, let's say, improve the outcome of these patients uh, while using uh, the accurate uh, grading, but also timely management. And we heard already a pediatric case. I would like to share with you an adult case, which I think is a scenario that uh, many of you in the room uh, would have seen frequently. A 60-year-old gentleman, relapsed refractory AML. This is a secondary AML with TP53 mutation. The patient was treated on label with CPX351, achieved first complete remission. And as you may guess, a transplant was indicated. Unfortunately, it was delayed because of some donor uh, issues. As expected, it's very sad. The disease has relapsed. Then the patient received a salvage treatment with venetoclax 5 aza And good news. The haplodonor is available, and before the transplant, it was proposed, although this may be questionable, a salvage treatment with gemtuzumab, high-dose uh, RSC, uh, based on the CD33 uh, status. And assuming we would like to proceed with this transplant after gemtuzumab, what is the patient risk uh, for VOD? And as you can see here, we have age, uh, we have the high-risk disease by itself, having relapsed refractory disease. This patient has been uh, previously heavily pretreated, I would say. Uh, the use of an antibody drug conjugates, and I think it is now well established that drugs like gemtuzumab or inotuzumab are important risk factors with VOD. But obviously, if you're planning a haplotransplant, it is likely that we will be using uh, a few two or three alkylating agents, including the high-dose post uh, psi. And indeed, uh, the patient was transplanted. Everything went well, engraftment by day 16. And two days later, during the round, he was complaining of an abdominal pain and weight gain. And the big question are these signals of VOD or it is just some benign symptoms? Well, 
actually, and uh, we'll discuss this, based on the refined uh, EBMT criteria that were already shown by Dr. Duncan, uh, this is what we would consider a probable VOD. And you've seen this slide, and actually uh, the uh, revised EBMT criteria were published in 2016. And after seven or eight years of using them, and thanks to the feedback from everybody in this room and uh, elsewhere, uh, we met and worked in the last couple of years, uh, but also we got inspired a lot from the uh, review and work from Dr. Cairo, whom I thank uh, a lot, about setting three big scenarios. The easy scenario would be the proven VOD, and actually this is a rare scenario. Because obviously you need a biopsy, you need very accurate hemodynamic evaluation. The clinical VOD is when things are easy and you have all the symptoms. But it's more tricky when it comes to not complete symptoms from the beginning. And this is exactly what's happening with this, pa with this patient. Obviously, in a probable VOD, there is a probability that it may end up not being a VOD. But this is something we are used to in the field, and we treat probabilistically uh, uh, infections, for instance, and many other uh, situations. Once we have suspected and diagnosed this probable VOD, which may become a proven or a clinical VOD, the second key question is about really uh, confirming the severity grading. And again, uh, we are relying on uh, the grading of mild, moderate, severe, very severe. One important change is that we tried, and this is the work of more than 30 experts for two years, uh, to move away from the multi-organ failure concept to the multi-organ dysfunction. Because obviously, having a MOF is not a goal per se, and you would like to anticipate and to identify the organ dysfunction very early. Also, you're familiar with these different criteria, and most of them are straightforward, very easy. There was some refinement when it comes to the weight increase, when it comes to the renal function, especially taking into account the baseline kidney function, because, of course, we're treating more and more patients who are old, who have comorbidities, and obviously they may not always start with a normal uh, kidney function. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, this has been also extensively uh, discussed and published by Dr. Cairo and colleagues about having this concept of trying to anticipate, although you may not have at a given time all the symptoms, so you can see the similarities. And obviously, when it comes to uh, grading of severity, you would like to be on the safe side. And then you would consider, I would say, the uh, maximum or the worst scenario. And obviously, it would be good news if you end up with a more favorable scenario. And given the complexity of the disease, we're relying on weight gain, we're relying on biology, we need the intervention of pharmacists. I think uh, there is uh, now uh, a great interest, and I believe in this meeting I don't need to convince you because it's a really uh, a, a model, an example of collaboration between all stakeholders where we need the intervention not only of the physicians, but all the other um, healthcare providers like pharmacists, nurses, nutritionists, uh, uh, ICU colleagues, but also we should not forget uh, pain management, uh, psychological support, and so on. So going back to uh, my patient, based on the refined EBMT criteria, he has probable VOD, and what happened is that we had these two symptoms at day, 20, day 18, and by day 21, the bilirubin started to increase. And the question that you are facing in the clinic is, is it too soon to treat? And if we have to treat, what kind of treatment is 
recommend it. And again, in terms of treatment, we've lived for 40 years with, I would say, some empirical approaches, whether it comes to heparin, whether it comes to steroids. But at the end of the day today, I think nobody would argue with supportive care. Supportive care is always crucial uh, in the management of our patient. But today, the only drug being approved, and we're celebrating 10 years of approval since 2013 now, uh, is the fibrotide approved by FDA, but also uh, EMA in Europe and many other regulatory agencies worldwide for the treatment of adult, but also pediatric uh, severe VOD. And in order to support uh, this beside the uh, approval uh, trial uh, and the data from the compassionate use program, and the drug has been used now for more than 20 or 25 years, thousands of patients have been uh, treated. We do have some recent good examples. This is a TIND program for you here in the U.S., and you may have included patient uh, in this uh, uh, cohort of more than a 1,000 uh, patients, uh, clearly establishing the importance of identifying this issue of multi-organ dysfunction, because obviously those patients who uh, didn't experience multi-organ dysfunction will do much uh, better compared to patients with multi-organ dysfunction. And this is actually a true uh, both in uh, adults but also in children, although in the same TIND study it was shown that the fibrotide would be effective in both uh, scenarios, although obviously the efficacy is much better when it comes to patients without uh, multi-organ dysfunction. In one of the polling questions, I alluded to the Defi France uh, study. So this is a real-world data, uh, real-world registry from more than 50 transplant centers in France where we have collected prospectively uh, the data of patients who were treated for defibr with defibrotide irrespective of the indication. So some patients received it for severe established VOD, some patient got it for prophylaxis, but some patient also got it outside transplant because we know VOD exists outside transplant, uh, auto, of course, but also with chemotherapy and even in solid tumors. And what we could show uh, in this uh, large registry, almost 800 patients, 798, I think, or 95, I forgot, the uh, fibrotide is effective and the earlier you intervene, the better uh, it is. And the other important message we had from both the DEFI France but also the EBMT Pass. So the EBMT Pass is, has been also published and it's roughly similar. It's a European uh, registry which was established after the approval of uh, the fibrotide. What we know is that sometimes it takes time to have resolution of VOD and achieve complete remission. And I'm emphasizing this because we may see patients who, after initiation of defibrotide, are improving after just a few days. And this is good news. But there is a tendency, at least in some centers, to then say, okay, they are improving, let's stop the treatment. And that is not recommended because actually we've seen severe flare of uh, VOD in these cases. That's one point. So it's important to give uh, the right duration of treatment, usually up to three weeks. Another important uh, piece of information is that it may take time, and usually it can take more than two weeks to achieve, or even three weeks to achieve CR. So really uh, very important. The uh, other uh, important parameter, and this is why uh, grading and trying to identify the severity level very quickly is important, is that whether adult, whether in uh, children, the earlier you intervene, the better it is. And when we combine uh, the data from DEFI France, from ABMT Pass, from the TIND, actually, it looks like there is a window of opportunity within like 24 to 48 hours maximum. This is when you would maximize the benefit that you would get from the use of uh, defibrotide. 
Another important information we could glean from these registries is that roughly up to 20% of VOD in adults can be anecteric. So bilirubin will not increase. Obviously, in pediatric and children, this number is much higher, but this could be explained by the physiology. So it's important to pay attention to this issue of anecteric VOD. And this is, again, where the parameters of having like probable VOD without increase of bilirubin are crucial. So you can see we do have now an accumulating body of evidence since 15 years, and I mentioned uh, defibrotide has been around for now two decades and more. Uh, clearly, that early initiation, early identification of uh, the symptoms, early initiation of treatment are really crucial to improve the outcome of uh, these patients. And as I mentioned, the window of opportunity is around uh, 48 hours. Well, again, the label, you know it very well. Just for the sake of being balanced, it is shown here. Uh, the dosage, 25 milligram uh, per kilo per day. And I take this opportunity to mention that it is useless to increase the dose. There has been a few studies uh, looking into the uh, uh, dosage of defibrotide historically. And actually, it doesn't bring additional benefit to increase the dose. On the other hand, you should not decrease the dose. So 25 milligram is really the well-established dosage. Last but not least, when it comes to uh, safety and side effects or adverse events, again, the profile of safety of defibrotide is very well known. Now we have thousands of patients who were treated. Obviously, you need to pay attention to the issue of uh, hemorrhagic event uh, but again, it is a multifactorial process, and we usually recommend to stop heparin, for instance, or other uh, factors favoring a uh, hemorrhage event. So going back uh, to my 60-year-old gentleman, uh, we initiated uh, the treatment very rapidly, so it was around 48 hours. Supportive care, uh, intensive supportive care, I would say. Uh, plus uh, defibrotide according to the label. Actually, it needed another day, day 22, to have the confirmation and having clinical uh, VOD. So you can see the symptoms started at day 18, but we had the full scenario, the full picture at day 22. So you would imagine it can take time. And I think we are all familiar with what can happen, you know, on a Friday afternoon, you start with one symptom. On Saturday, you see another symptom. On Sunday, you see another one. On Monday, you start thinking about it, and then it's already Tuesday. So it's not only the uh, issue of the Friday afternoon acute leukemia story, which we all know. It's also about some of these, you know, uh, easy or benign or, you know, uh, symptoms, non-specific symptoms, but uh, they can accumulate uh, over time. So in summary, similar to what you heard from Dr. Duncan uh, regarding the case of this uh, two-year-old boy, uh, the management of uh, this uh, patient uh, could tell us clearly that hepatic VOD can be expected because if you uh, have a careful analysis of the risk factors of the uh, patient situation, prior treatments, um, clearly you would try to guess the increased risk of having VOD. Then hepatic VOD can be predicted. Obviously, it is a rare uh, condition, uh, but still, by paying attention to these symptoms, although they are not specific, and we do not have biomarkers, for VOD, unfortunately, and it is unlikely that we will have soon, it can be predicted because by using refined EBMT criteria, for instance, on having very early diagnosed with the issue of probabilistic uh, VOD, then it can be predicted. We have to start the treatment very early. And it happened to us a couple of times. We started the treatment and it proved to be something else. And there's no harm you know, to treat with one or two days of defibrotide, and then you stop it 
if it is uh, something else. And actually, by having this very strict, very stringent approach of early treatment within 48 hours maximum, one would be able, for, I mean, we hope, hopefully, to avoid the catastrophic outcome because, again, the outcome, uh, looking into the medical literature, was about 80% mortality without early uh, intervention. Thank you so much, and I think we have some good time for questions and answers. Uh, Mitch Kyer in New York. Uh, I'm going to answer Christy Duncan's earlier question about which classification he is in. I'm not biased, but I would just say the Cairo Cook classification. Um, on a more serious note, um, Professor Modi, I, I sort of want to challenge you on one of the more dogmatic things you said, and you didn't say many things that were dogmatic, and that's about the dose. So um, your data that you showed, the registry data, as well as uh, Paul Richardson's data from the TIND study overwhelmingly shows that it's, it's all about complete response, right? It's all about complete resolution, that the survival rate is relatively low in patients who don't achieve a CR. So I think we're in agreement on that. Um, the question is that there are still going to be, depending on how severe the disease is and how you grade it, of course, there's probably still going to be 30 to 50% of patients who are not achieving a CR. And there was a study that was published by St. Jude's back in 2015 that took refractory patients who had not achieved a CR by day 28 and dose escalated those patients and was able to rescue 59% ended up going into a CR and 41% of the 41% of the total end up being alive at the end um, with no increased risk of bleeding. So uh, my challenge is that Ken Cook and I are uh, started a multi-center study <clears throat> taking patients who don't achieve a CR and doing a dose escalation intrapatient. So I think the answer is not in yet for those that are failing standard dose. Well, I, I mean, I am, I'm well aware of the 2015 paper, but there are also the dose finding studies, historical studies pushing up to 40 and even 60. And obviously, well, you initiated uh, the study, and I do acknowledge the value of CR in this situation. My only comment today, while waiting for other results, I would say I would rather stick to the label and to the dosage. And... And now, that I would agree to. Uh, and at least in the adult population, uh, and, and maybe it's different in the pediatric population, we've seen more accident, I would say hemorrhagic accident, if you increase the dose. Because historically, we used to adopt exactly the same approach, saying, well, we're going to push a little bit on the dosage to achieve CR. But I think we have stepped back on this. Yeah, I think the difficulty I'll just end is that we don't have a good pharmacodynamic marker to look at in terms of whether we're at the right dose or not. So that hinders the question. Um, maybe we'll take one of the questions from the cards. Uh, so one of the questions was, if you were using defibrotide prophylaxis, what is the dose? And so based on the studies, you use the same dose as you would use at the treatment. There's not dose modification. Um, I think one of the challenges that centers sometimes have is when do you start this? Do you start it at the initiation of uh, conditioning therapy? Do you start it on day zero? Um, and, and I don't think that there is a clean answer for that. Um, I know at my particular center, we have done this. And some of the starting, we prefer to start early if we can with conditioning. But at times, because of practical issues, either related to the regimen or other things, often start it, can start it a little bit later. Sami Vasu, Ohio State. Thank you. This was a wonderful session. Um, Dr. Moti, you alluded to earlier that um, oftentimes VOD and TMA can occur concurrently or in a spectrum of endothelial damage syndromes. Um, and anecdotally, we've seen patients with really low platelet counts respond very well with platelet counts higher than 100 after defibrotide, and defibrotide is used widely in Asia. My question for you is, still there is a lot of hesitation on the part of some clinical uh, treating teams when the platelet count is less than 10 to start defibrotide. Can you comment on that? 
Yeah, very good and timely question. And actually, there are two questions here in the cards about this issue. The uh, how to reconcile thrombocytopenia and defibrotide. So in general, what we, if patients need to be treated with defibrotide, we won't hesitate to uh, start the treatment. But obviously, we would maintain a very high level of uh, uh, platelets through transfusions. So uh, the only cases where, unfortunately, we had to stop defibrotide while we knew it is needed was that when there is a severe hemorrhagic event, but it's relatively rare. The challenge is sometimes in TMA, they're often refractory to platelet transfusions, and we can't get to that 30,000 threshold. I, I, I agree with you, but, you know, sometimes the whole machine, you know, <laughs> getting a little bit messy, and these are on a case-per-case -case basis. I, th I don't think there is like a sort of a universal recommendation on how to manage them. So we try to do, I would say, our best <laughs> Uh, by fractionating the platelets, by avoiding any other risk factors. The good news is that uh, we will have soon, I hope, uh, some drugs uh, active in TMA, so that may help. Thank you. I think one of the benefits, Austin, you know, I think that platelet thresholds for a patient who has VOD who's on defibrotide varies widely at different centers. Uh, we tend to try to keep our platelet count at least greater than 30 in the setting of VOD, not in the prophylaxis setting. And one of the side benefits, as you know, is that that helps provide colloids, a preferential colloid over crystalloid to help with a lot of that edema and the ascites um, at the same time. Uh, so an another question, uh, is anecteric BOD generally less severe or symptomatic when compared to hyperbilirubinemia when hyperbilirubin is there? And, you know, I think that's a fantastic question that we don't necessarily know the answer to yet. Um, in some cases, it seems as though it may have a slower or less dramatic onset. And this is just, we don't have large studies looking at this necessarily, but you certainly can end up in the same place. And oftentimes you'll see transaminitis or other, um, other features of liver dysfunction along with that. I think the other thing to say at that is I've also seen where you start with, it may be more of a slow burn, you start with the anecteric VOD and eventually get to that spot with the hyperbilirubin avia. Um, but I do think it's important, to, even in the anecteric setting, to try to support with your best support of care, with the fibrotide, what your options are at your center early. Raj Bajba from Nationwide Children's Columbus. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I have uh, a comment on the immediate question which you had about anecteric VOD. We at our center did a retrospective study comparing patients with anecteric VOD with ectric VOD and found that patients should be started on treatment as soon as you diagnose them, even if they are anectric, because that can also lead to mortality. So um, that was a comment on that. I, I, I wanted to comment on a slide which you presented about summary of diagnostic criteria comparing the Cook Cairo, the EBMT pediatric criteria, and the EBMT adult criteria, in which it clearly... If you see the slide and follow on the question which you asked, which criteria are the best? If you just see the slide without knowing the details, you will say, oh, the Cairo Cook criteria are the best. But the three cells which are missing in that, the three points which I wanted to point out was biopsy. I don't think anybody in the right state of mind, any BMT physician will do a biopsy in a kid with VOD unless you are needing to s s uh, separate GVHD from VOD. So I don't know if, if that is a, a point to differentiate the three criteria. Secondly, um, ultrasound suggesting of reversal of portal venous flow was one of the um, points which you had included. I think that is a late finding. We all know that. And as a result, the diagnostic criteria are used to diagnose patients with VOD early, not late. So I, I don't think we need to know late reversal of flow. So I, I don't think we, we I, I at least don't feel that is a criteria which I will be depending upon. And I'll be hoping to diagnose VOD much before reversal of flow happens. And lastly, it was hemodynamic wedge pressure, which again is an invasive procedure, 
I don't think in nowadays anybody relies to do a, a wedge pressure um, because of the morbidity associated with the procedure itself. So in my experience, pediatric EBMT criteria remain the best criteria and without the need of a biopsy and without the need of measuring any wedge pressures. I uh, wanted to know your thoughts on that further, if any. Thank you. So for the sake of time, I'll be very quick. Thank you for acknowledging and uh, all this. I, I think time will tell us what will be uh, the best way to do uh, the diagnosis. And uh, the question is not about, you know, uh, EBMT versus ASBMT versus this. But I believe what I heard is that we share the same goal, which is about early detection. And, uh, and early management. And this is where we believe that having this probable uh, VOD diagnosis is uh, extremely uh, important, but also the refined EBMT criteria uh, are introducing something which is now widespreading, I think, which is the role of elastography that we will not uh, debate right now. I, know, I, and I completely agree with you. I think that reversal of flow is too late to try to treat, and we try and find those signs early. I often say that to my colleagues and things that we're working with. You don't want to find it late. Um, I do believe that we are out of time for our session. Um, and so, Dr. Uh, Professor Modi, and I think we'll stick around up front if you have questions or stick around. So please um, join us. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash EJG 860. This program is supported by an independent medical education grant from Jazz Pharmaceuticals.